Welcome to episode 49 of North Myths, Legends, and Folktales. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we learn the outcome of the fight between Beowulf and the dragon, and the one warrior who stayed with his king in part two of Beowulf and the dragon. Fully armored under his strong helmet, his shield on his left arm, his sword by his side, the valorous hero of the Geats went down the cliff path towards the dragon's cavern. He saw the stream which flowed from the stone ramparts, steaming hot with deadly fire, nigh to the horde, could not endure long the flame of the dragon. But filled with his great heart with battle fury, a storm-like shout, he gave a strong battle cry that went under the gray stone. In wrath, the monster heard him. He knew the voice of man. Nor was there time then to seek peace. Fiery flame issued forth. First, it was the dragon's battle breath. The earth shook. Beowulf stood waiting, his iron shield upraised. The monster curled itself to spring. Beowulf waited in his armor. Then forth came the wriggling monster. Swiftly to his fate he came. The shield gave that strong hero good defense against the flame. His sword was drawn, and it was an ancient heritage, keen, edged, and sure. Both the dragon and the king were bent on slaughter. Each feared the other. Beowulf swung his great sword and smote the dragon's head. But the blade glanced from the bone. For Veard did not decree otherwise. Then the hero was enveloped in fire. For in wrath at the blow, the monster spouted flame far and wide. Greatly did the brave one suffer. His followers standing on the mound were terror-stricken. To the wood they fled fearing for their lives. But one remained. He alone sorrowed and sought to help the king. He was named Wilaf, a shield warrior, a well-loved lord of Schuldings. He remembered the honors and the gifts which Beowulf had bestowed upon him. He could not hold back. He grasped his wooden shield and drew his ancient sword a giant sword, which Onila gave him. To his comrades he cried, Promise we not to help our lord in time of need, when with him we drank in the mead hall? Rather would I perish in fire with our gold giver, than that we should return again with shields unscathed. Advance then, give help to our lord. Together shall we stand side by side, behind the same defense. So speaking, the young hero plunged through the death smoke, hastening to Beowulf's aid. Never before had Wilaf fought at his chief's side. Beloved hero, Wilaf spake, do thy utmost of yore, let not thy honor fail. Put forth thy full strength, and I shall help thee. Then came the dragon to attack a second time, brightly flamed the fire against his hated human foes. The young hero's wooden shield was burnt up, and behind Beowulf's he shielded himself. Again, Beowulf smote the dragon, but his gray sword, Nagling, snapped in twain, whereat the monster leaped on the lord of the Geats and took the hero's neck in his horrible jaws so that the king's life blood streamed over his armor. But Wilaf, smote low, and his sword pierced the dragon, so that the fire at Beowulf drew his death dagger, and strikingly fiercely he cut the monster in twain. So was the dragon slain, so did the heroes achieve great victory and renown. But the king was wounded unto death. The dragon's venom boiled in his blood, and he knew well that his end was nigh. Faint and heart-weary, he went and sat down, gazing on the rocky arches of the dragon's lair, which giants had made. 
Wheelof came and washed the bloodstained king, who was weary after the conflict, and unloosed his helmet and took it off. Tenderly he ministered under Beowulf in his last hour. Well knew the king that he was nigh unto death. It is now my desire, Beowulf said faintly, to give unto my son, if it had been granted to me to have him won, this my war armor. For fifty winters I have ruled over my people, <coughs> nor was there a king who dared come up against me in battle. At home I waited my fateful hour, <coughs> never seeking to make strife, <coughs> nor ever breaking a pledged oath. So now, when I am sick unto death, I have comfort, because the ruler of all mankind can charge me not with murderous things when I die. <coughs> Then he bade Wheelof to bring forth the treasure from the dragon's lair, so that he might behold the riches he had won ere life was spent. The young hero did as was asked of him. He brought forth ancient armor and vases of gold, rich ornaments and gems, and many an armlet of rare design. A banner of gold which lit up the cavern he also bore to the king. In haste, lest the last breath should be drawn ere he returned, he found Beowulf gasping faintly. So once again he laved the king's face with cold water until he spake, gazing on the treasure with thankfulness. <coughs> to the Lord of glory I give thanks, he said, because that he hath permitted me ere I died to win such treasures from my own <coughs> Give thou the gifts unto my people according to their needs. <coughs> I paid life's cost for them. <coughs> no longer can I remain. Then the king made request that on the cliff top overlooking the sea there should be raised his burial mound, and that it should be made bright with fire. He desired also that it should be built on Ronsness a memorial, so that seafarers whose ships are driven through spray mist might call it Beowulf's grave. To Wheelof the dying hero then gave his golden neck ring, his helmet adorned with gold and his strong armor, which Valand had fashioned, bidding him to make ever good use of the gifts. To the last of our race, the Vamungdings art thou, O Wheelof. Beowulf said faintly as life ebbed low, veered, took one by one away, each at his appointed hour. The nobles and their strength went to their doom. <coughs> now I must follow them. These were Beowulf's last words. His soul went forth from his body to the doom of good men. Wheelof sat alone, mourning him. Then came the battle laggers from the wood and approached Wheelof, who spoke angrily to them because that they had fled their lord in his hour of need. Nevermore, he vowed, would they receive gifts of lands. Each one would, when the lords were told of their cowardice, be deprived of their possessions. For noble warrior, Wheelof cried, death is better than a life of shame. When the people heard that Beowulf was dead, they feared that their enemies would renew the blood feuds and come against them. The messenger whom Wheelof sent to bear the sad tidings spake of wars to be, when many a maiden would be taken away to exile and many a warrior slain. Then would their ghosts lift up their spears, the harp would be heard, not as it awakened warriors, but instead the blood-fed raven would ask how fared it with the eagle as it fought with the wolf to devour the slain. In sadness and sharp grief, the people went towards the dragon's lair, and they saw the dread monster that had been slain. In length it measured fifty feet 
horrible it was and blackened with its own fire. Round the dead king they gathered, weeping sorrowfully, and Wheelof spake, telling them of Beowulf's last words and his desire that he should be buried in a high barrow at the place of the bale fire. Then, while the byre was being made ready, Wheelof led seven men into the cave, and what treasure remained they brought forth. The dragon was thrown into the sea, and the body of the gray old Beowulf was borne to the headland which is called Ronsness. A great pyre was built, and it was hung with armor and battle shields and bright helms. Reverently they laid the great king thereon, the well-loved lord for whom they mourned. Never before was so large a pyre seen by men. Torches set it aflame, and soon the smoke rose thick and black above it. The roaring of flames mingled with the wailing of the mourners, while the body of Beowulf was consumed. A dull dirge sang the old queen, and again and again and again she said that oft had she dreaded the coming of conflict and much slaughter. She feared for her own shame and captivity. Heaven swallowed the smoke. The people then raised a grave mound of great height. For ten days they labored, constructing a wall which encircled the ashes. Much treasure did they lay in the mound, all that was in the hoard. And there the riches lie now, of as little use to men as ever they were. Twelve horsemen rode round the great mound on Rome's nest, lamenting for their lord. All the people sorrowed together, and they said that Beowulf was of all the world's kings and of men the mildest and most gracious, the kindest unto his people, and the keenest for their praise. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.